Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. Uh, just before we get going, a reminder, this is not personal financial advice for you. But with that out of the way, let's get straight into having a look at today's uh, look at the big picture, I guess. Well, OK, the year to date, the Aussie market is down 12 percent. Uh, last five days have uh, been pretty good for the market, up 2%. My portfolio did OK, which is a bit of a change. If we look at the American market, down 18.7% year to date. And in fact, up to the end of June, I think it was reported it's the worst first six months of a year for the last 50 years. So, um, you know, hopefully it's the end of that uh, negative sentiment. Only time will tell past five days, American market doing okay, up 3%. So some positive momentum there also. Uh, did One thing that did come to note, uh, I did notice I was running a scan on Stock Doctor, looking at stocks not doing well over the past year. And in amongst it was the Magellan Financial Group. And it's sort of like a, you could comment, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Uh, you're looking at Magellan, it's been an awesomely good company for a long period of time floated way back here um, at 2004, I think it was, for a dollar and got all the way up to more than $60 and was a market darling for a very long time. But yes, how they fall out of favour when things don't go so well for the company. Despite that fall, actually, uh, if you look at this and do like a compound annual growth rate, if you were smart enough to put some money in at the beginning here, even though there's this been this big fall recently, it's still showing an average compound annual growth rate of about 14 to 15% per year and add in some dividends along the way. And you've done very well, but you'd be looking just a little bit sick at the moment with the fact that you could have got out here above 60 and here we are now just above $10. You know, in the most recent times, last six months, things have been just miserable for the company. The funds under management at the start of the year or the end of January of 2022 with 93.5 billion. Those funds under management have now fallen to 61.3 billion. That's why one third of the funds under management. And so any wonder that people are selling out of this particular stock, not advice for you either to sell out or buy it because you think it's cheap. Of course, I don't have a financial services license, which I keep reminding everybody of. Uh, and there it is sitting in there in my scan from Stock Doctor. It was the fifth worst company over the last five years from the Aussie 300. The companies at the top here don't have any data because they haven't been listed for more than a year. But the worst performers, Zipco, and we've commented a number of times about my view of the buy now, pay later space. Anyway, you could pause the video and have a look at some of the worst performers there if you wished. If we come back and uh, look at some of the features of these stocks, and you know, you know, I'm interested in looking at trends, you will notice that very few of them have make any money. Uh, they lose money over time. That's EPS before abnormals. I've only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight or so that make money, the rest lose. Now, only three of them have earnings per share growth. And if we drop and have a look at the last six months, the worst performers there, uh, similar sorts of things happening. Only two of those companies actually have earnings per share growth. Uh, and that's the reason why I like to focus on those sorts of things. Trying to avoid these uh, companies which are falling out of favour because the market just gets sick and tired of the fact that they're just not making money. Now, I just thought I'd have a look at the you know big picture looking at the long term. Uh, and over the last 40 years, if we look at the S&P 500 in the US, um, the chart in green is uh, just from Google and I put over the top of it what uh, an exponential growth line would look like if you were thinking that a, a reasonable estimate for the market to grow each year is 7%. And you can see here that over the 40 years, well, uh, that is not a very accurate representation of what's been going on. If we move it to 8%, um, then the market has still outperformed that over time. If we go to 9%, starting to look pretty much like it's fitting what's been going on in the market. Uh, even though the market is now down by about 20% from the high here, it would be sitting above that 9% trend line. If we go to 10%, then suddenly it would appear that 10% is perhaps an unreasonable expectation. Although if you think it's fair for the market to go up by 10%, 
you might be looking at it right now and saying the market is actually undervalued. If we throw over the top about 9.5%, we finish up right here uh, at, at the 3,900 level that it's currently sitting at. So I guess you need to think about is 9.5% per year, and that's not including dividends, is that a fair representation uh, of what you would expect to happen in the US market over the long term. Um, I'm thinking uh, probably there's a little bit more downside to come, but that's just a personal opinion. But there you go, the market has pretty much delivered, according to this over the last 40 years, around about a 9.5% compound annual growth rate. Uh, well above it for quite a long period of time until the GFC came along. And then it's pretty much trundled along, followed that trend ever since. If you look at it over the last 20 years, though, and uh, you sort of go on holidays in four year chunks of time, all of the volatility does seem to disappear. Like if we start back here at 2002, come back and have a look what's going on to, uh, four years later, and then four years later, then four years, then four years, then four years, not really all that volatile when you think about it, and I, I keep talking about the fact that I do think you do need to take a much longer time frame view of what's going on, and yet we got these volatile times like the GFC and COVID and the sell-off in, down in here, and the most recent one falling by more than 20%. But, uh, you know, if you average it out across that 20 year period, uh, we've got an average growth there of 3.24% per annum. Compound annual growth rate for the Australian market. That's the S&P ASX 200 fund. Now the American market has done a lot better than that. Uh, and if we look at that, and this is from a stock doctor where they don't actually put up the S&P 500, they have a proxy, which is the Refinitiv US 500 index. But it's, it's pretty much the same thing. And you'll see the American market has gone up by 7.2% per annum across that time frame. So you'd be thinking, wow, well, um, it'd be much better to be invested in the US than in the Aussie market. But we do need to take into account dividends also. Now, uh, this chart here shows the dividend yield on the S&P 500 since way back in the 1800s. And most recently, it's averaging about 2%. It's a bit less, but let's call it 2%. Uh, the grossed up dividend yield for STW, the Aussie 200 fund, is 5.63% courtesy of Stock Doctor. And so once you then uh, put those in, and you can get this from a chart of the uh, total return index, uh, the total return on the S&P 500 is averaging 9.36% per annum, and on the Aussie market is averaging 8.3% per annum over the last 20 years. Now, I'm not sure whether that includes franking credits, but if it does include franking credits, then I suspect that the return from the US market compared with the return from the Aussie market are very much the same as each other. But anyway, I'm just saying, I think it's the long-term picture that matters. That's my view of things. Yep, short-term volatility is really stressful, but it's the long-term picture that matters. Uh, forecasts of impending financial doom might get headlines and the AdSense revenue for all those YouTubers that keep cranking up uh, stuff from Chamath Pally Hapatir and, and Michael Burry and uh, anyone else who's willing to say that the market's about to implode, well, they're not guaranteed to be accurate. Remember that the US market has fallen by more than 35% three times since 2000 and yet it still delivered an average annual total return of 9.36% over that time. So my advice, remembering that I don't have a financial services license and I'm totally unaware of your individual financial situation and investment goals is, review your performance against an appropriate benchmark and then decide whether you need to make some adjustments to your approach. In my case, I started in 2019 with the YouTube channel at $510,000. By July 2021, it had grown by 50% compared with the market, only up by 30%. And following almost 12 months through to June of 17, 
of this year. It dropped by 18%, whereas the market only fell by 12.5%. So my strategies were not performing well. But since that period, over the last three weeks or so, the fund has grown by 7.2%, whereas the market has been pretty flat. Compound annual growth rate across that whole period is 8.2% compared with the Aussie 300 index only up by 4.3%. Now, once you add in some dividends along the way, my dividends are around about 2%, so I get, call that about 10. VAS is just a tick under 4%, I think, so call that 8, 8.5%. So the strategies in the long term are going okay. Now, I'm retired, so what I'm about to say doesn't really apply to someone like me, but um, you know, let's suppose you're just starting out and uh, you've got 40 years worth of investing ahead of you, and uh, you're going to invest $10,000 each year into the market and you can get 8% return compared with uh, only getting a 6.5% return, say, from putting your money into VAS or STW. Now, you might sort of think, oh, well, you know, 1.5%. Yeah, I know I'm going to do better, but how much better? Well, the answer is a lot better, uh, such is the impact of compounding interest. Uh, if you get 8%, you're going to get about $2.6 million dollars as your final balance. Now, uh, this ignores income tax, of course, uh, along the way on any profits you make. So if you're buying and selling, then that will uh, reduce it down. But if you're able to find a way to invest your money and uh, try to not sell out and hence incur capital gains tax, uh, then of course that's a good thing to do. But the difference is, is noticeable, isn't it? From 2.59 million at 8% down to 1.76 million only at 6.5%. So something I think to be considering there, that long-term picture, really important to keep that in the back of your mind. Try to always remember that when you're facing the short-term volatility that has been abounding, I guess, over the last few months. And finally, if you're interested in what's uh, happening in the housing market, at least my take on the mathematical impact that rising interest rates will have on uh, what will be happening to prices across Australia. Uh, you can have a look at a 10 or 11 minute uh, discussion of that on my Patreon page. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you have found this informative once again. Uh, and until I catch up with you again next week, I do hope you continue to keep very well.